What do you think is the best all-star event to bet, just value-wise? You know, is it the slam dunk? Is it the three-point? Is it one of the skills competitions? Like, what do you think is the best one to bet? Yeah, so we could definitely scratch off the slam dunk because there's a, there's judges involved and who knows what they're thinking. There's a lot of different nuanced stuff. My favorite piece to bet, an event to bet, is the three-point contest. Mm. I think anybody could win it because anybody could get hot in a stretch. All you got to do is get hot two or three times, and next thing you know, you're raising the trophy. I think um, I like Tyrese Halliburton at plus 650. I like to look at guys mm. that don't use a lot of energy in their jump shot. For, for contests like this. For example, Dame Lillard has a very compact for a three-point style contest. He doesn't even jump on his. But like a guy like Kevin Herter, he's getting up like a full jump sh- jump shot, essentially, how he shoots him out in Sacramento. So those are the guys I wouldn't want to back. I like Halliburton at plus 650. I thought the outrage for my guy Julius Randle sneaking in, he's at plus 800 to win the contest was a little harsh. He's been shooting the ball really, really well this year. He's like top seven or eight in the league and made threes. I thought that was uh, a little harsh to to kill Julius Randle for getting in. I, I, and in any of these contests, I have a hard time going with the favorite. Buddy Heald's obviously been burning the net down for the Pacers, but at 425, I'm looking at Halliburton at plus 650. Marketing's also plus 650. Those are good numbers. Yeah, that's a good call. I'm, I, I live down in Miami, so where everybody's rooting for Tyler Hero just so we can see a snarl and anything like that. But the <laughs> one good thing about the the new style where there's a draft, and now that we're doing it, you know, pregame like this, the big thing is who's going to be the number one pick uh, in the game when they do the draft. So where where are you leaning on who should be the number one pick or who will be the number one pick? Yeah, it was funny that Giannis asked – they, or they asked Drew Holiday about this yesterday on TNT during the Bulls game. And he uh, Drew Holiday said, I hope Giannis picks me first. But if he doesn't pick <laughs> me first, and I, I'm not going to be – I won't be too offended. Man, it's tough. The first pick, it could be a, a whole range of guys. I would have to say oh, – man, it's, it's, it's really tough. Who has the first pick? Does LeBron or Giannis have the first pick? You know, question. that's a good question. I'm yeah, going to say LeBron. I mean, yeah, it's got to be Luka. The, the right answer is usually LeBron for everything. So I'm going to say LeBron. <laughs> no, that's a that's actually a good point. I, I mean, it's got to be Luka. He's at the top of the list, of course. There's a there's so many superstars in the NBA. If you don't pick Luka, there's, there's not a lot of guys you can go wrong with. Sean, I thought this was an interesting market, and you can bet this right now on BetMGM. Which team will finish the season with the most regular season wins. You have the Celtics at minus 125, Bucks at plus 225, and the Nuggets at plus 325. And you look at them right now, Boston's got 42 wins, Milwaukee and Denver both have 41. So it's right there. I don't think you can lay the juice with Boston. Maybe you can. I see value in Denver there. What are your thoughts? I would avoid Denver just because there's some teams in the West that are coming. Like the Clippers are on their way up the ranks. We know Phoenix. If you look at Phoenix's record without Book and KD now coming in the fold, they were still on their way up in the West. Now they get D-Book back and then they add Kevin Durant. They're on the way. I would avoid Denver just for that aspect. They do win all games in Denver. So that that's a big plus if you're looking at that spot. Milwaukee is probably your your best bet. They're playing insane ball right now. They've won 12 in a row now going into the break. The only thing about Milwaukee that bothers actually bothers me a little bit is I feel like the last couple years they've been resting on their laurels with Giannis. Like Giannis is going to get it done, no problem. I love the addition of Jay Crowder, boss man 99, but he's also old. Robin Lopez is old. Ingles is old. They have a bunch of old guys that they're adding here. And I feel like they should be just emptying the clip and trying to go get some more help for Giannis. And they haven't done that the last couple of years. Then we see Giannis go down with the wrist. If he, if anything happens to him, they're going to have an extremely hard time. Middleton's been in and out of the lineup. So I, I, I think you'll be able to get that minus 125 number on Boston here in a couple of weeks if, if, that, if that prop is still available. But I would look at the plus money with Milwaukee. And confirmed, LeBron does have the number one pick in the draft. So that's that's been that's been confirmed now. All right. So you know, in the East, Sean, we've we've been hearing a lot of talk about 
Boston and Milwaukee and Brooklyn because of their trades and what's going to happen with the Knicks. The one team that seemingly isn't is, is below the radar are the Sixers. I haven't been reading a lot of about them. They're 38 and 19, third in the East. Where is Philly in this kid? Especially now with the Giannis injury, can they sort of make a move in here? Yeah, we got to find out some more info on Giannis and see how that wrist, how hurt the actual wrist is. Philly, listen, during the regular season, I like Philly. They're great. I think I'm with everybody else. We They're a really hard team to trust. I, I love Embiid, of course. He, he is just taking – since he's taken his body very seriously the last three years and he's gotten in tip-top shape, I know you guys remember the, the the famous clip of him sitting on the stretching board eating a hamburger. He doesn't do that type of stuff anymore. Since he started to take his body seriously and has been in tip-top shape, he's been insane when he's on the floor. I love Embiid. I'm not worried about him. It's James Harden. We know his history in the playoffs. And say what you want about Doc Rivers. If you think he's a good coach, he's a bad coach, whatever, he hasn't gotten it done in the playoffs. That's the only thing that's the question mark out there. I like Philly. I like what they've been doing. They've been playing really, really good basketball since, like, first week of December. They're playing insane. So, I love Maxi. Uh, another guy that I have a hard time with is, like, their, their bench. Niang is good, but he's hot and cold. Um, there's a lot of different things with Philly that, that give you pause. But they've been playing really well. A couple weeks ago, they were plus 1,400 to win the East. Now they're down to plus 450 or so. So they're, they're coming. Can they compete in the playoffs? We'll see. It's tough to trust Doc. It's also tough to trust Embiid, you know, to just stay healthy for a playoff yeah. run. It seems like he's always getting banged up. Talking with Sean Little here on Beck UL Daily, PJ Glasser, and Jim Rodriguez. Let's look at the Western Conference, Sean. The New Orleans Pelicans, man, that's a team I've loved from the start, and they just can't stay healthy. More Zion news coming out that he's going to be sidelined. Is it officially time to start being panicked about the Pelicans? Like, are you worried? Yeah, no question. They sit in the seven right now. They're 30 and 29, but the three guys behind them are all a game back. Utah, Oklahoma City has been playing their tail off for the entire season. Now. Everybody's been waiting for those guys to slow up. They've been playing extremely hard. Yeah, it's time to worry because if they don't have Zion in the fold, they're not going to get anything done. They just don't have the bodies. They don't have the scoring. They can't score enough to keep up. Zion is such a force when he goes to the basket and is on the floor. He's giving you 28 at night. So it's hard to fill those holes with a guy like him coming off the floor for an extended period of time. And I also feel like it weighs on the guys on the team when it's like, oh, Zion's out again. When's he coming back? We don't know. And it's tough to, it's tough to keep that energy. Sean, talking about uh, keeping up some energy, Kyrie, obviously, uh, much ballyhoos, goes to the Mavericks. They haven't had much success with him there. Him and Luka together, they've only played two games, lost both of them. Where do you see the Mavs here? You know, is, is, is this a team that is ready? Is this a team that's going to figure it out? And, and Jason Kidd, man, you talk about having your hands full with that. Yeah, that's <laughs> – Jason Kidd's hands are full for sure. Um, we, we have to wait and see. Two games is a, is a small sample size, of course, and, and we'll see how it shakes out. But like I said, speaking of New Orleans, Dallas is only a game above them in the six to, to make the playoffs outright and not have to worry about the playing. So we'll see how it shakes. But I'll say this. I do want to talk – this guy, Luka Doncic, I don't really understand. Until he takes his body seriously and starts getting in real shape, it's going to be an issue for the Mavericks going forward. He had nine days off. He, it, it, was a, it was a mix of an injury. He was coming back. He worked himself back. Nine days later, he comes back and looks like he put on six, seven pounds. He's huffing and puffing every game up and down the floor. He's chugging water. He was tired in the first quarter the other night. And then uh, yesterday, he is on the press conference. They ask him what he's looking forward to uh, for the All-Star break. He's like, yeah, going to Mexico on Sunday. So... I'm afraid that Jan, or that Luke is going to come back and be even more out of shape than he already was. There can't be a nine-day stretch where you come back and you're out of shape in the NBA. Until he starts taking his body seriously, he, is, he, he uses the ball too much. His usage rate is too high for him to not be in tip-top shape, and he starts to fade down the stretch. He's done in the playoffs previously. So that's what worries me about Dallas because if Luke is not ready to go, they're going to be in trouble. 
What about the Memphis Grizzlies? John Morant might be my favorite player to watch in the NBA, but man, I think he messed up when he told everybody he's good in the West, you know, <laughs> because I don't think he's good anymore. Where does Memphis fit in all this in your eyes? Do you still think they're kind of a piece away? Maybe. Memphis is still a top three team in the West, no matter what John Morant says. The way they get out in transition, they, they're the best team in the fast break. And then in the half court, they have trouble offensively in the half court. They can still get to the paint. John Morant is one of the best in the paint in the league. But they added Luke Kennard. He hit two threes the other night. They needed some – desperately needed some half court shooting to complement Desmond Bain. That's maybe the, the, the two underrated deals that aren't being talked about enough at the deadline are Luke Kennard to Memphis and then Plumlee to the Clippers. They needed some extra bigs. They got another big in Plumlee who plays hard, rebounds, runs the floor. That's what the Clippers needed. Luke Kennard was a good addition for Memphis. I think they're, they're going to be a top two, top three team in the West, Memphis is going to be. When it gets to the playoffs, if you could slow those guys up and put them in the half court and make them score – in the half court and they, they can't just turn you over and get out in transition and do what they want to do, then they might be – they're easier out, I would say.